Hello everyone, this is Ted Bauman here with your Bauman Daily Friday video. Uh, skipped last week because of uh, Turkey Day, but the video I did before that was kind of a reflection on the nature of the business that I'm in and the offer that we make to you. Um, I hope you've considered that. Uh, you can always click on the link below this video to explore the opportunity to subscribe to the Bauman Letter. One thing I want to point out uh, is that it always comes with a money-back guarantee. You really have no risk if you decide you don't like it, you don't want it, you can always get your money back. Uh, so I think that's an important point to make um, that uh, sometimes gets lost in the mix. Uh, people think uh, you know it's a, uh, a risky proposition. There's no risk to you. You could uh, sign in, you could root around and look at the, uh, the model portfolio, see the picks that we've already made, see the reports that I've issued, uh, and then if you decide you don't want to pay for it, you can just get your money back. So really no risk to you. Today I want to talk about China, more especially the, uh, the news that uh, the U.S. Congress has passed unanimously for the first time. I think I can remember it's been a long time. A, a bill that would effectively um, make it impossible for Chinese companies to trade on U.S. stock exchanges unless they comply with U.S. regulations around their accounting, uh, their auditing, that sort of thing. Now, to start with, let's acknowledge that uh, there are some Chinese companies that have abused uh, the, the system as it stands, which I'll talk about in a moment. There was Luck and Coffee, which a lot of us know has been a terrible, terrible uh, you know, fraud and uh, the Chinese government cracked down on it. But by that time, a lot of people had lost a lot of money. So there are reasons uh, to be cautious about this. There are reasons to be, uh, you know, to think positively about what the United States government um, or the Congress legislature is proposing. But on the other hand, there are some Chinese companies that are absolute world beaters in terms of their growth prospects, the returns that they've generated, we hold some of them in the Bauman letter uh, model portfolio. Uh, and it just seems crazy to uh, miss out on the opportunity to, to, to make money from those, those particular trades. And that's what would happen if the U.S. Congress were to withdraw. So let's talk about what's proposed. Basically, the, the bill that is in front of President Trump, and I assume that he will sign it, says that uh, if a Chinese company fails for three years to comply with the requirement that it submit its audits to oversight by the U.S. authority that's set up to do that, um, then it will be uh, removed from listings in U.S. stock exchanges. Note three consecutive years. So conceivably, a company could comply in year one, and that resets the clock, or it could go year one and two without complying, and then in year three, it could comply, and that resets the clock. Bottom line is that this is not an immediate threat. Um, nothing is likely to happen in the short term. So anybody who is selling these stocks because of this, I think, is doing it for the wrong reasons, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, the second thing to note is that almost all the major Chinese companies are audited by uh, Hong Kong subsidiaries of U.S. auditing companies. So, for example, Price Waterhouse Coopers, China branch is, or, or sorry, Hong Kong branch is the one that typically audits some of the biggest names in the Chinese um, stock market and the Chinese, uh, you know, the listed company. So really, at the end of the day, um, you know that those subsidiaries have to adhere to the standards that are set by those companies. And those standards, in turn, are monitored by U.S. authorities. So there already is some indirect monitoring that goes on here. Um, it's only the companies that are not monitored or, or audited, rather, by uh, major reputable firms that are really the, the problem. And um, again, uh, this is something that, um, you know, is more of a threat for the smaller firms, not the big ones that are making all the money for U.S. investors. The third thing, I think the important thing, is that nobody on the U.S. side wants this to happen, at least not anybody who is in the financial sector and who is well informed about the relationships between China and the United States around finance and investment. Um, whatever your feelings about China as a country and about their government, and I certainly have strong feelings myself about it, the reality is that there are investors who want to make money by investing in these companies. There are institutions on Wall Street that want to make fees by facilitating that. And those people have far more clout than you and I do. In fact, they probably have far more clout than the members of Congress do, because they're the ones who can influence how the Treasury Department will implement these rules. They could effectively neuter them, which is exactly what I expect to happen. Now, in the midst of all this, in mid-November, uh, some major Chinese companies lost about 
$290 billion worth of market capitalization in just two short days. And here's the interesting thing. It had nothing to do with the United States. And that's what I want to talk about for the rest of the video, because I think that's what everybody's missing. The real threat to investment in Chinese companies does not come from U.S. legislation. It comes from China itself, as well as other countries in the region. So let's talk about why. Well, first of all, let's talk about India. India and China are embroiled in what is in effect a border war in the Himalayas. Uh, and in response, India has effectively banned almost all of the major consumer applications, the, the smartphone apps uh, that are linked to companies like Alibaba, China's huge Asian-based um, online e-commerce company. So already you have the second biggest country in the world um, essentially ejecting these companies from its own operations. That's a huge threat to them. That is something that... Um, you know, I think a lot of people are missing is that it's really what's happening in Asia, in China, that is the big issue with these companies and their future. I don't think they're going to be delisted from the United States, but they could actually see declines in their stock prices for the reasons I'm, I'm outlining. So in addition to India blocking and forbidding, you know, some of these big companies like Alibaba and Tencent, from operating their apps within India, you also have other Asia and Pacific uh, company or countries rather like Japan, Australia, Thailand, uh, India again, Indonesia, others getting together and trying to develop and Vietnam as well, trying to develop regional trading alternatives and regional supply chains to get around the problems of working and dealing with China. Um, which are getting worse all the time. The, the Australians right now, for example, are embroiled in a terrible fight with China because uh, the Australians have been vocally supportive, for example, of Hong Kong, of the, the, the democracy protesters there, um, and for various other reasons. And China is basically making it impossible for Australia to continue to trade with them on certain issues. So these things are also a big threat, but not so much to the um, to the technology companies that are the big winners in terms of Chinese stocks. But nevertheless, it illustrates that there are other issues that you should be paying attention to if you're invested in Chinese stocks. The biggest single issue is the attitude of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, um, that is the biggest threat to these companies and their share prices, not the SEC, not the Treasury Department, not Wall Street, uh, not U.S. Congress. Here's why. Well, the first thing is, these companies are following the business model that many U.S. companies have done, like Google and uh, Apple even, although Apple tends to be a bit better about that than Google. Facebook is a classic example. These companies make their money by harvesting data from their users, and the Chinese companies do exactly the same thing. And the Chinese Communist Party is concerned that this gives them a, a resource that actually threatens the Chinese Communist Party's own uh, surveillance, which is, you know, it's it's basically apocalyptic, the level of, of surveillance that Chinese people are subjected to. I would certainly never put up with it myself. But nevertheless, these companies are acquiring the kind of data that threatens the Chinese government's monopoly on surveillance of their own people. So that's one reason why the Chinese government is keen to rein them in. The second one is that, like U.S. Internet companies do, and as I've explained several times, these companies engage in anti-competitive behavior. They squash startups, they buy them out, they prevent rivals from emerging before they can actually become a threat. They do all kinds of things to make their position unassailable, and that gives them the ability to uh, price things at monopoly levels. Uh, and typically they do that by squeezing suppliers, they do it by chiseling business partners, uh, you know, basically kind of like what Amazon does. Very, very simple. Uh, we're very close to it. The difference here is that the Chinese government actually doesn't want this to happen. Um, it shouldn't be happening in the U.S., but our government right now seems to be dragging its feet, although there have been um, discussions in Congress, there have been hearings in Congress about trying to rein this in. The Chinese Communist Party, for better or for worse, is actually doing it. So that's another big threat, that these companies have made part of their revenues by developing uh, monopolistic business positions, which the Chinese government does not want, because that threatens the stability of the consumer class in China. If, if it allows companies to start ripping people off by overpricing and monopoly behavior the way that happens in the United States, um, that causes instability. That's the one thing the CCP never wants to see because they know that uneasy rests the crown uh, on the head of the ruler. And that has always been the case with the CCP. 
The third big issue that concerns the, the Chinese Communist Party is that many of these firms, like their U.S. counterparts, have been migrating into finance, trying to link financial applications to their existing game platforms, sorry, message, messaging platforms, uh, platforms and so on. So, uh, you know, WeChat, for example, um, is essentially a gateway to all kinds of financial opportunities. And this is what happened with Ant Financial. You may have heard that uh, earlier this year, um, it was about to IPO, a, a huge IPO that was going to happen. Uh, and then Jack Ma, who is the uh, CEO of Ant Financial, opened his big mouth and basically criticized Chinese regulators because obviously they had been uh, asking questions behind the scenes. And he said, you know, the way that the Chinese government is regulating these financial slash technology apps is that they, you know, it's, it's old fashioned, it's not forward looking. Well, the, the Chinese Communist Party didn't like that at all. And um, it wasn't just because, you know, here was an uppity capitalist trying to tell them what to do. It's because well, the way these companies work, they originate loans, particularly micro loans from Chinese people who use their apps. But then the loans are actually financed by big government owned Chinese banks. So, for example, Ant Financial only originated and funds only 2% of its actual loan portfolio. The rest of it is funded by major government owned Chinese banks. They bear all the credit risk. So sensibly, um, you know, the Chinese government said, well, this is not going to work for us. We need a better deal here. And so they put the kibosh on the IPO. Now, that leads us to the, <clears throat> the reason that I've already alluded to, which is that the one thing that uh, the Chinese Communist Party will never tolerate is the emergence of a separate class of business people in China who believe that they have the right to participate in public polit politics and political discourse and decision making. All decision making has to go through the party. Although some uh, businessmen and women in China are members of the party, uh, people like Jack Ma are operating as individuals, uh, capitalists, the way that they do here in the United States. Once you make a billion dollars, you think you have the right to tell everybody else what to do. In the US, we kind of go along with that. Um, uh, we don't always pay attention, but sometimes we do. In China, they slap them down hard before they get up. And that's because China continues to be a dictatorship of the Chinese Communist Party. So fundamentally, these are all reasons other than uh, US Congress to think about how these companies' future is likely to evolve. That future is likely to face a lot of constraints. They're, they're, they're likely to have to unbundle some of their subsidiaries. They're likely to have to rein in their financial integration with their applications and their business models. Uh, they're likely to perhaps uh, see reduced revenues because they have to uh, start competing in some parts of their segments that they're not currently competing in. So fundamentally, um, the Chinese government does not want these com companies either a, to damage um, the Chinese consumer, because that would be bad for the Chinese Communist Party, or B, they don't want these companies to become too big to fail, because then it would mean that the Chinese Communist Party would have to adapt to them rather than the other way around. All of that is a bigger reason to worry about Chinese investments than the U.S. Congress at this point. Now, there's another factor here that I think a lot of people don't really recognize, and that is that... Uh, for the most part, most Chinese companies are not actually listed on the stock exchange. Instead, what happens is that the Chinese companies have created something called a variable interest entity. Now, here's a graph that shows how that works. It's a graphic uh, from Bloomberg. Essentially, what happens is that a company that's based in China with a Chinese ownership, uh, because only Chinese uh, nationals are allowed to own shares in uh, Chinese technology companies, they want funding, but they can't get it because it, uh, you're not allowed to buy directly into Chinese technology companies. Foreigners can buy shares in some segments of the Chinese economy, but not technology. So what the company does is create a foreign shell company, typically listed in the Cayman Islands, and that in turn solicits funding on the U.S. stock market through shares that in that particular funding vehicle. So, for example, Alibaba Group Holdings, the shares that we trade, Baba, are actually shares in a Cayman Islands based shell company. Now, the way that this works is that uh, you invest in the shell company uh, and you get access to, the, the, you know, you could play the share price for the Chinese company, uh, but you're not really directly investing in that uh, in that Chinese company. Now, 
the Chinese company has to put revenue into the shell in order to justify the the investment in it. But ultimately, that revenue is completely controlled by the owners of the companies in terms of the voting rights and so on. So this is another kink in the issue. Uh, it's one that, again, means that there could be all sorts of shenanigans at the legal level before we ever get to the point uh, where the U.S. Uh, SEC decides to delist some of these companies. My particular recommendation is there's a lot of money still to be made. These companies generally trade at far lower price to earnings ratios than their U.S. Uh, counterparts, which means that there's a lot of value to be had here. Um, they are to be to be had at a bargain right now because they're being pushed down by all this political activity. Um, but just today, I'm recording this on a Thursday, um, there's been a big turnaround and some of those companies are starting to climb back up in the U.S. markets. Interestingly enough, after the news comes out about the Congress, then they begin to recover. A lot of this has been baked into these companies' share prices for weeks now. So my recommendation is if you own Chinese companies, hold on to them. They're likely to rise in price, maybe not as fast as they would have without the Chinese government crackdown. If the time comes to sell, uh, we'll know, I think, well ahead of time, thanks to the political nature of this whole ex uh, exercise. Anyway, this is Ted Bauman signing off. I will talk to you again next week. Have a good one.